Olá a todos, é, bem-vindos a mais uma é, entrevista é, do Arise. Hoje nós temos é, um convidado bastante interessante, ele é o Dr. É, Robert Holton, da Universidade de Winchester, que tem uma ampla carreira em história medieval, mas também tem um pé é, no mundo dos games. Ele é, atuou como consultor histórico é, nos é, games da, da Paradox, o Crusader Kings. E ele também tem várias publicações é, sobre é, Idade Média nas mídias contemporâneas e sobre é, historical game studies. So Robert, it's a very it's a, it's a, an honor to have you here. Thank you for accepting our invitation. Obrigado. And well, to begin with, uh, why work uh, and research games? How did you get involved uh, with the medium in the first place? Um, well, there's a, there's a formal answer to that, and then there's the true answer to that. And the true answer is I'm a, I'm a massive nerd. Um, I grew up playing playing historical games and games of all sorts. My my, my father, my brother, my my mum, and it was just well, first of all board games, but then as games like Civilization came onto the market in the 90s, I just got more and more interested in these these games as a way of addressing history. Um, and that that could have been it. I was meant to go off and study mathematics at university. I wasn't meant to really be looking that much at history. But I came back to history. And as I started to get more of an understanding of it, the way history is constructed, the way we talk about history, I started to think more about how games represent the past and I got very lucky um, I've been able to pursue this at the University of Winchester been able to look at how all of these games deal with history and in particular deal with the Middle Ages which I think there's a particular period which games are very useful for considering basically yeah it was a nice coincidence of my, my personal life and my academic life. And it's very fortuitous for me that I've been able to, to do this. So. Robert, you are credited as a researcher for Paradox Interactive's Crusaders Kings 2. How did you get involved with this studio in the first place? So again, so um, a lot of this comes back to me being a, a giant nerd. Um, so I started playing Crusader King, the original Crusader Kings, um, right back, I want to say around 2008, possibly a little bit earlier, and the game was a little bit rough. It's a little bit rough around the edges. Um, it doesn't really hold up particularly well to modern standards of of design, of um, polish, and so forth. But underneath all of that, it was a brilliant game. It. So I played, as I've said, I played Civilization. I played Total War, various other similar games, which put you in the position as, as a ruler of, of a, a kingdom or some other polity. Um, but none of them really had the same kind of depth, or anywhere near the same kind of depth as Crusade Kings did. And this was right back the first the first version of the game, because what you could play is any character at all, really, anyone from the Byzantine Emperor all the way down to the, the lowly Count of Shetland, for example. And I was hooked, because while, while the, the warfare aspect of the game was always an important element, um, warfare was much less important within Crusader Kings than it was in games such as, well, Total War, fair enough, the hint is in the title, but also Civilization. There's much more diplomacy going on. There's much more relationships going on. It was much more interesting experience for me. And so when Crusader Kings 2 came out, I, well, I, to be honest, I spent far too much time playing the game. I got involved on the Paradox Interactive forums, um, just discussing the game, discussing the history around the game. And then let's see, it would have been around 2013, 2012, 2013, um, I applied to the Paradox Beta Tester Programme and was well was it was accepted so paradox um routinely have open invitations for beta testers for their various games um they do this i don't i don't have a precise ins and outs of this but part of it comes down to activity on the forums and whether or not you're well behaved you're constructive on the forums so i'm not sure if the bar's gone higher but 
back in 2013, I, I met the requirements and it's, it's been brilliant ever since. What exactly did you, uh, your role as a research entail? Could you describe to us uh, more or less how the process works from, 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 from yeah. giving the input and how this ties in with, with the game and so forth? Yeah, absolutely. So um, beta testing, as, well, as far as I understand it, beta testing is relatively the same across any sort of any game in particular. So we're looking for, looking for issues with the game, um, things that aren't right, basically. So anything from crashes to desktop right the way down to marginal spelling errors, like, like maybe having too many L's in a king's name or something like that. Um, and I started off beta testing back around, been around the old gods into the Rajas of India, um, so back 2013 and so forth. And you identify crashes, you write up a short report, and that goes to the developers themselves who, while well, they do the hard work, they, they fix the problems, they adapt any bugs, um, and they, they make the game run correctly. Although moving on from that, um, as we started to get into the Rajas of India expansion for Crusader Kings 2, I started to take more of a role as well, in researching characters for Crusader Kings. So for those of you who've not, not played any of the games, the, it's, the game is basically a massive database of historical characters. They select more or less any one of these characters to play through, through the course of the game. But all of these, well, a large proportion of these figures are based on actual historical figures. So my job entailed tracking these figures down. And at the higher ends of the social structure, this is relatively straightforward. So it's fairly easy to find the king of any given territory, the, the ultimate ruler of these places. For, you can figure this out for more or less the entire span of, of the game. And as you get towards the, the later part of the, the, the time span of Crusader Kings, so as you're getting into the 13th, 14th, 15th centuries, we've got a lot of data for figures further down the social structure. However, when we're looking earlier on in the game, particularly in the 8th and 9th centuries, so the material covered by the Charlemagne expansion, there are huge gaps in our knowledge of what was going on, um, who was in charge, indeed even how these social structures, these political structures worked. So in the first instance, my job was to carry out research, to identify figures that we can use, first of all, as rulers of kingdoms, but then also as, as the dukes, as the counts, or the equivalents, um, wherever in the world you are. Uh, yeah, the, the, the figures that we can use within these lower roles on the social pyramid. And the way I went about this, I'd start, I'd start at the top. So I can't speak for any of the other researchers, designers, beta testers, but my approach was to start at the top, build the family of the ruling dynasty. And that very often helped me fill out many of the lower levels because very often these kings, they'll, or they'll marry the daughter of one of their leading dukes. This just makes perfect sense that at that point I've got a link to this duchy and I can flesh out the family there. And continuing on the way down the social pyramid. So I draw up a, a map of, the, well, yeah, a dynastic tree, basically. And I used to have a fairly large stack of, of paper, like A4 paper pads just with, random scrawlings on it representing various individuals and their connections. Um, so I, I put this together, I'd compose this then into, well, I code this as the characters. So I create individual characters, I create dynasties to connect these characters, and I connect these characters to where they ruled and when. Um, you can find all of this, in fact, yeah, you can find basically all the work that I've done on Crusader Kings um, within the open files of the game. There's a file that consists of characters, one, another one uh, with um, dynasties, and another one with the territories, the titles. So that's that's all great. That's all really interesting, very, from my perspective, it's very interesting at any rate. What 
I think is more interesting is what happens when we run out of characters. So as I've said, when we go back to the earlier periods, when we go further down the social structure, we have large gaps in the historical records. And at that point, well, we have to start making educated guesses. So uh, we'll have, maybe we'll have mention of, say, I don't know, Count of Flanders, and we've not got, we have no idea when exactly they ruled. We knew they were alive whilst Charlemagne was in charge. But beyond that, we've not got much to go on. So we'll construct something that looks right, something that fits in with our understanding of the period, our understanding of social structures, and what looks right looking at what we've constructed based on actual figures. And actually, to me, that's one of the most interesting things about Crusader Kings. As while well, there's been a vast amount of research gone into this, and there's a lot of very interesting bits and pieces you can pick up about the various historical characters throughout the day. What's more interesting to me is that they've gone beyond what we can know about the period. It's created a fully functional model of medieval society, or at least the higher levels of it. And in doing so, they've had to create characters, they've had to fill in gaps, which is something you can't do, you can't really do so well within academic history. You always have to tie down the exact figures you have to say explain who goes where and in a way this makes it makes the game a much more interesting tool to use to explore the medieval world as it could have looked so all of this is extrapolations from what we actually know and to a certain extent this is very similar to to what we do when we write history we only ever have, or archaeology for that matter, we only ever have a certain number of data points that we can acquire. But we still construct arguments on that basis. We extrapolate from that data. And to my mind, that's exactly what the team over the Paradox Interactive, what they've done in creating Crusader Kings. They've taken a limited range of data points and they've constructed an argument on that basis. So in a way, they've done what academic historians do. They've taken a very different approach, but I think it's still potentially valid as a scholarly resource. Speaking specifically about uh, scholarship, uh, you were an expert on medieval Italy. Did you focus your efforts on on, on on the things you were most familiar with, or did you branch out? Did you draw from your own research to do this this this, this, this research, uh, huh. research uh, task? Yeah, absolutely. So. Um, as I said, I worked on Rajas of India, which is well outside my, my, my field of expertise. But yeah, as you say, I worked also on Charlemagne and initially yeah, I focused on the areas that I knew best. So in this case, Northern Italy, Italy and I started, well, my starting point was King Desiderius. So he's the King of Italy when Charlemagne comes to power. And well, if you, yeah, if you, if, yeah, I'll go off on a tangent about the history for a second, sorry. Um, so Desiderius, King of Lombardy, um, when Charlemagne comes to power and inevitably gets conquered by Charlemagne because that's that's what Charlemagne does, or at least as, as far as the game is concerned, that's, that's the main thing that Charlemagne does. Um, so I started with this one figure and from there, well, I, I built the family, the family tree. So we yeah, went down to um, Desiderius's children and then all the way back to the first king of the Lombards. That's the interesting thing though, because as, you, as you know, you're absolutely right, I start with what I know where possible, because it, it, it makes sense, it's easiest for me. But very swiftly that moves into areas that I'm not so familiar with. Because the Lombards, they've got a lot of marriage relationships with, well, the Bavarians, and occasionally elsewhere within, well, the pre-Frankish world. So I very swiftly start having to construct family trees in other areas. So it's all very much integrated. But yes, absolutely, as you say, I start with what I know and work from there. And how much change in Crusader Kings 3? Did you use the, the same uh, framework you have already worked with in Crusader Kings 2? Yeah. So, um, 
I think, yeah, as a Crusader King's free has been out for less than 24 hours, which is brilliant. It's something I'm very excited about. Um, I've not been through the database with a fine tooth comb, but I suspect a large part of it will look very similar to that which was used for Crusader Kings 2. So the map, the map has changed fairly dramatically in the way that it's, it's presented. So there are many more points that you can move to on the map now. Um, so there will be there'll, there'll have been characters who disappeared or been sidelined, but ultimately I feel that a lot of the database looks very similar. However, the game's gone off in a, a whole range of new directions. So most superficially, it looks brilliant. The graphics are much smoother. For me, it runs faster as well. More importantly for us, though, um, is the way that the game handles. Yeah, well, the way that the game handles what it's all about. Because for Crusader Kings two, for the first Crusader Kings, well, there's, there's not really any objective. You just let loose in the sandbox environment to do whatever you want, and that's brilliant. That's very freeing. But it also means that a lot of people just end up trying to conquer the world or just trying to conquer a large part of it. And in doing so, they're kind of straying from what it meant to be a medieval ruler. You don't get that many kings setting out to conquer the world. Of course, there are. there's always some megalomaniacs, but that's not the default role. Fat kings, well, yeah, they're meant to deal with warfare, but that's only one part of their portfolio. They need to be good stewards, they need to be good diplomats. And Crusader Kings always allowed you to do this, but never really quite encouraged you to. And so by default, most people just play as conquerors, or play as warlords. What's changed with Crusader Kings 3 well, the big change for me, at any rate, is how the game guides you, how it suggests, how it tweaks you towards certain routes of behaviour, and this is all by making the personality traits much more important for your characters. So, previously, in previous games, you'll receive traits of um, you'll be perhaps chaste, so you'd be more pious, but you'd be less likely to have children. You could be diligent, which will boost your stats across the board. You could be a glutton, so you'll be less healthy. Um, you could be, yeah, you could be avaricious, you could be greedy, and um, so your stewardship will rise, but your diplomacy will drop because everybody despises you for taking all their money. Crusader Kings 3 has made these attributes, these um, traits, more than just stat bonuses or malices. And these guide the way in which your character can behave. I'd really encourage everybody to get a hold of this and have a look at this. Um, this is, there's a new stress mechanic. So if you act in a manner that's out of, out of kilter, that doesn't really compare with the personality traits of your character, they all get stressed, they'll start to struggle in aspects of their rule. And the game, through this and through various other elements, there's a huge number of um, storytelling aspects that are new to Crusader Kings 3. But through these various different areas, the game encourages you to role play more. You're not just a, set, you're not just a stat block. You're not just setting out to conquer as much of the world as you can with this character and then pass it on to your very carefully bred genius offspring. Instead, you can be guided towards being more of a steward, to building up your kingdom, to raising finances. You could try to be, more, you'd be guided to be more pious. There's a lot more depth to the game, I think. And I'm really excited to see where that goes from here. You have designed a board game about the investiture contest. Could you tell us a little about this project? This, I, I think you're making this sound a bit more grand than it actually is, but I'll, yeah, well, yes. Yeah. So um, what I've done here, so uh, I run various modules at the University of Winchester, including one which addresses the investiture contest and another one which addresses middle ages and computer games. 
So this game kind of emerged as part of the Middle Ages and computer games module. It's a way for there's a way for students to understand how games can represent history through their mechanics. So the basic idea here is that games are fundamentally a different type of media from films, TV, books, what have you. Um, and this is for various reasons. They're, they they, well, they they can tend to be more immersive. They rely on player agency, and but fundamentally they're structured in a very different way. So games can present history through by telling a story in the same way as a book or a film could, but games can also present history through their mechanics. This is something um, Adam Chapman writes about in, at length here. Um, so games like Civilization, like Total War, like Crusader Kings, they present history not so much as something that happened, but as a series of explanations what happened. So in essence, all of these games, they're built about, built on a historical argument. Because these games, they all represent models of an element of historical society. So it would be a very abstract model. Um, it will be curtailed and focused on what that game wants to deal with. But it's an internally consistent and it's a holistic model. It functions, it works. And that model, in essence, is an argument about that particular period, that particular theme, that particular issue. So I created this game as a way of engaging with that. So it's about the investiture contest because that's what I work about, work on when I'm being a regular historian. And we, it, it's, it's map based. It looks at Northern Italy. Um, the players take up their, the roles of various key figures of the period. Um, so the emperor, Henry IV, is great rival, Pope Gregory VII, various other figures, including um, the anti-Pope Matilda of Canossa, various other people. And it's a very simple game. Um, the instructions well, the instructions for the basic game consist of a single side of A4. Um, the advanced game is just one extra side, and most of that's just listing new objectives for the players. And the aim of the game is to exert influence across the game board. And the way I've structured this is designed so the basic game and the advanced game present two distinct arguments, or two opposing arguments about the investiture contest. So the basic game takes the traditional perspective of the investiture contest, that this is a very simple binary conflict between the Pope on one hand and the Emperor on the other. So in this version of the game, the players play as, as teams, teams of three on each side, representing the Pope and his allies and the Emperor and his allies. And whoever, whichever team has more influence or influences more provinces at the end of the game wins. That's it. The advanced game presents the counter argument to this. And this is that it's a more complicated conflict, that these various different figures all have different ideologies and different goals. They, so while the anti-pope may be supporting the emperor, they're divergent in what exactly they want. So the emperor, well, he wants the anti-pope to get to Rome and crown him as emperor. The anti-pope, though, well, he's based in Ravenna. He's got other issues. So while he wants the emperor to be crowned, he also wants to keep control of his archdiocese to keep his bishops under control. So in this advanced version of the game, the players each have different objectives. A lot of the time, they're complementary. Most of them aren't mutually exclusive. But there are plenty of opportunities for the players to come into conflict with each other over the course of the day. So what I have the players do, so what I have the students do is, is play the game, the basic game, just to get the hang of the rules. I'll have them play the advanced game, and I'll between at the end of each playthrough, I'll have them sit down, 
talk about the mechanics within the game and what they think the argument is that this represents. And after they've played through the game a couple of times, I'll have them talk about how this compares to their understanding of the period. And I ask them to modify the game. So the idea here is that by changing the mechanics of the game, they change the model that the game is making. And in doing so, they present a counter argument or a more nuanced argument. And I think there's a huge amount of potential um, for using this as an advanced learning tool at university level, potentially as a scholarly tool as, well, yeah, within academia more generally. The reason why a game with the proper citations, the proper basis in research couldn't be used as a method of communicating historical arguments and even debating them, interrogating them and providing counter arguments um, alongside that. As I've said, the game is, is very simple. It's very basic. Um, that's, that's by design. The idea is by having these very simple mechanics, it's easier to see what exactly the claim is they're trying to make. And also it's not too difficult to modify, to modify it, to create a more interesting, more nuanced argument. Still on the topic of, of, of uh, teaching and, and, and your students, a few years ago, you authored a paper on the impacts of historical games on undergraduate students. And I understand it's part of an ongoing research project you've been developing. Uh, what were your main findings back when you first wrote this paper, and have they have you, they changed it so, somehow ever since? Yeah, well, no thanks. Um, this was yeah, as you said, it's, it's, a, it's an ongoing project. But yeah, um, the the initial findings then um, yeah, there were, there were four things basically. So I started. I, I asked a group of students at the University of Winchester why they were interested in history. Um, you know, what, what, had, what had inspired their interest in history, which forms of media had got them into the subject, um, and also to what extent they thought various different forms of media had influenced their understanding of different periods of the past. What I found from this is there's a surprisingly large, well, possibly surprisingly large number of students are significantly influenced by computer games. Um, both in terms of getting them into his, yeah, getting them into history in the first place, but also in terms of uh, yeah, influencing their understanding of the past. And this, I don't know, this is possibly something that we should expect. Really, well, there are a lot of people playing games nowadays, and there are a lot of historical games available. And there's a lot of potential, I think, for these games to influence their players. The players have to engage with the game. They have to engage with the ideas that the game's putting forward in order to progress. They basically they're basically obliged to learn in order to win. So that's a nice basic neat finding. Um, beyond that, though, I found that different periods of history, so games were more influent, games were more influential when dealing with certain periods of history. Specifically, games were more influential when we look at the pre-modern period, so the Middle Ages and the ancient world. I'm not entirely sure why this is the case. Um, it's particularly interesting because there are many more games about the more, more modern period, the contemporary period in particular. Um, I believe... I believe it's in, there's a chapter in Historia Ludens, um, the recent volume that's come out, um, which deals with this. And it's, it's highlighted that the vast majority, well, a substantial portion of games are set post-1900. But yet, these games are most influential when we go back before 1500. And I think this may be in large part because this is the period of history that we don't really teach in schools. At least not in at least not in the UK. Um, so we'll very typically have students come into university and they haven't really studied the the ancient period, the medieval period, in any great depth at all. Yeah, 
The third thing we described that the findings suggested um, is that different genres of game influence their students in different ways. So uh, I found that action games, games that um, Adam Chapman would call realist simulations, so things like Assassin's Creed, Medal of Honor, Call of Duty, all of these meticulously graphically, um, yeah, graphically faithful representations of history, these sorts of games tend to, tend to be more potent at getting students interested in a period of history. Meanwhile, games like Civilization, like Crusader Kings, like Total War, these in-depth strategy games, games Chapman would call conceptual simulations, um, they tend to be better, they tend to be more effective at developing students' understanding of a period. And this kind of makes sense, I think, because the, the well, games like Assassin's Creed, they're beautiful. They're a joy, they can be a joy to play. Um, but at the same time, they're not particularly deep. So they're great at grabbing your attention, but ultimately they're not going to teach you that much about a period. On the other hand, games like Civilization, like Crusader Kings, although they are getting increasingly pretty, the graphics have improved markedly over the last couple of decades, um, th they're nevertheless much more about their depth, the depth of their mechanics. It's much more important for the players to learn how to manipulate these mechanics in order to win. So games like Assassin's Creed, or to a certain extent, that's just based on reflexes, on learning skill within the game there, which can be incredibly challenging, but it's very different from learning how to manipulate statistics, to manipulate systems within games like Civilization. Um, there's an interesting side point from that is that role-playing games barely ever appear as, as well, are barely ever cited as things that get as games which either inspire interest in history or alter understanding of it. And I'm not entirely sure what's happening there. Um, I think there might be this might be connected to the fact that most role-play or well, role-playing games tend to be tend to occupy either the fantasy or science fiction genres. So they're perhaps not as visibly historical, they're perhaps not regarded as an actual source for historical knowledge in the same way as, as other genres of game are. What is interesting though, is when you get games like Crusader Kings, which have this role play element within them, that seems to have a very strong impact on the degree to which students engage with history whilst playing the game. There's something there, I'm not quite sure. Um, and the final the final issue the study presented, so there's a substantial gender gap when looking at how games influence students. Um, male students were considerably more likely to say that games had influenced them. And to a certain extent, I think this is this is a consequence of well, it's a consequence of the weight of statistics. Um, the article I published it was from a relatively small sample size, and it wasn't looking in particular at this gender issue, but nevertheless, it, it did highlight this, this strong divide. I think this can be explained to a certain extent by well, the sorts of games that male and female students, male and female players tend to play. So at this point, we're looking at, well, gender difference within games taken as a whole is more or less non-existent. It's, it's, we're looking at about 50% of, of people who play games are female, 50% are male, give or take. But the sort of games that people play does tally very strongly with gender. Um, so, for example, MMORPGs, I believe a lot of these were looking at 80% plus male players. Sports games, um, first-person shooters, they're very typically played more by men than by women. And likewise, strategy games like Civilization, anything from the Paradox series, um, these are very often played by men rather than women. 
and I think it's it's almost coincidental. Um, the genres which tend to be best at inspiring, sorry, the genres which seem to be tied most strongly to influencing understanding of history and interest in history. These genres tend to be the ones favoured by male players rather than by female players. So I think that's what's going on here. Um, I should say it's, it's a it's a study that I've not it's still ongoing. Um, I do have a larger data set with a, a piece that should hopefully be getting published in the next couple of years. And looking at a broader sample size, we still see this discrepancy, this division between male and female students. But um, it's a coincidental discrepancy. So we have so we have plenty of female students who are heavily influenced by games. We have plenty of male students who aren't influenced by games. The main divide seems to be whether or not someone considers themselves a gamer, or someone play, plays a large or plays a substantial amount of games, rather than being a direct consequence of gender. Historical game studies attract research from many different fields. These scholars have their own research priorities, interests, and even epistemic standards. As a medievalist historian who also writes about the games, how do you see the intersection between traditional history and game studies? Are there particular synergies or points of conflict? Yes. <laughs> so, yeah, there's... There's traditionally been a fair amount of resistance to looking at games as serious history. And to a certain extent, this is fair enough. So the, the first game, the, the earliest game, they're very simple, very basic, often silly things. And that's undeniably the case with some games in the modern world. So there's, yeah, games, Games have a tendency to be violent. They have a tendency to simplify issues. Um, and there's a great, as a result of this, there's a great tendency to shy away from using games to represent any sort of serious events. Um, at the same time, though, there's a, there's a growing understanding that games can present serious stories. And they can look at, yeah, you know, they can look at important subjects, political, social issues in new and interesting ways. And while I don't think we're ever going to shake the idea that games should be fun, there's a growing understanding in some segments that fun is a very broad term. So games can still be interesting, not necessarily entertaining, but they can still be useful without really being fun. And I think this is creating a lot of opportunities. So to my understanding, as, as I see it, um, the areas of history that have more tradition have been fastest to get on board with, with games as a potential med a valid medium tend to be the ones that have already be have been interacting with other media. So areas which have looked at, well, film, TV, um, and yeah, literature, medievalism in general. This tends to be towards the more, yeah, the more social history end of the spectrum. And there's been a huge amount of excellent work put out from this and continues to be published in this, in this sector. What I find interesting though, is that games can be, or certain types of games can be particularly useful for the more, um, I suppose traditionally the more dry elements of history. So modeling political systems, economic systems, these sorts of things. Anything that re requires a large number of data points, anything that requires the construction of a model. This is something that games, I think, could be very useful as a means of exp exploration. So we can go back to Crusader Kings. This is a very handy example. It's one of one of the big forthcoming or well, big growing fields within medieval studies currently is well relationship network studies, and it's something that I've been dipping in and out of for a few years. 
So it's basically it's looking at who is actually connecting to whom, who is talking to each other within any given political system. We have a tendency as medievalists, we tend to look towards, well, some of us tend to look towards narrative sources. So these great big accounts of the lives of kings, of popes, of great nobles. But that doesn't really tell us that much about how the world actually worked in practice. If we look instead at the charter sources, as the dip, at the diplomatic sources, at who is actually communicating with each other, we can get a much better idea of how the medieval world actually worked. And I think this could be where games like Crusader Kings come in. Because we've got this ready-made vast database, we've got this model of medieval society. And there's a lot of potential, I think, to tweak that to maybe use it on a smaller scale, to maybe provide a bit more depth in the model, a bit closer ties to research, a bit more citation. And I think potentially games could be incredibly useful as a means for looking at these relationship networks, but for looking at anything else that requires this sort of data management. It's a way of getting to grips with how these systems work and possibly using them to try and understand the motivations of the various figures within them to a greater extent. So yeah, it, it's, a, it's still an embryonic area of study. And I, I can't see resistance to this going away or it just being outright dismissed anytime soon. But I think there's a lot of potential there and I really hope to see some great work on that in the next few years. Wasn't there a scholar who actually uh, built a social network uh, diagram with all the relationships in Crusader Kings too? Yes, there was. And that's appalling because I've forgotten who they are. Um, I'm terribly sorry, and I will send the details over. <laughs> because I recall when I started for the first time, I said, well, you know, if this network was like based on, 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 on actual sources all the way through, mm. this could be a really powerful tool to make this sort of, of, of no. data visualization more 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 intuitive for, for historians. No, this is, you're absolutely right. And uh, this is atrocious because I, I, I have cited him and I can't remember who he is. And I'm truly apologetic um, if, if he's watching. Um, <laughs> but no, yeah, absolutely. I know exactly the, the, the model you're talking about. So he, he let the game run. Um, and yeah, produced a, a beautiful and detailed chart of what had happened after 600, 700 years of, of play, um, or hands-off play rather, and you, know, you get this wonderful complex diagram showing all the marriage connections, all the family trees, and it's just incredible. If nothing else, it just highlights how well these, these connections which start off so very insular, so you've only really got connections with people in your immediate geographic zone. After six, seven hundred years, more or less everybody is connected within a few steps. Um, we, get, we get weird and wonderful things like, I don't know, Kazakh Khans ending up connected by, by two degrees of separation from the count of Dublin. Um, so yeah, there's, there's a lot of potential there, I think. And now, on the other hand of the of this of this scale, uh, specifically the 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 more cultural historical aspect and and the cultural studies aspect, uh, you also worked as an editor of the Public Medievalist, which is one of the largest public history websites uh, devoted to the Middle Ages. What can you tell about your experience with the magazine? How did you get involved in it, and what do you do there exactly? Yeah, so it was, it, again, it was it it all comes back to being a giant nerd. Um, so. Let's see, we back back in 20, 2014, yeah, I wrote a brief piece for um, for, the, for the magazine about about well, about Crusader Kings too at the time, um, and that went down well. That yeah, um, I know the I know the chief editor Paul Strait went um, from for a while back as well, um, and a few years after this, he started looking to expand. The magazine to expand the website a bit and in particular to start talking about games and he put out a call for editors and i responded and i 
I got in, which was which was great. So my role within the website is primarily editing. Um, I don't want to lay too much claim to doing too much of the work here at all. Uh, to be honest, I, 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 everything is handled by well, everything is handled meticulously by the growing public medievalist team. Um, but yeah, I, I'm currently I'm currently in charge of the of the games column. Um, so I'm, solicit I'm always soliciting for any sort of articles to do with computer games and the Middle Ages, or any sort of games rather, and any aspect of the Middle Ages, any representation of the Middle Ages. Um, and it's mainly, yeah, it's mainly, it's mainly about asking people to write articles and then editing it changing things around. We're always particularly keen to hear from early career scholars. If you're currently doing a, writing a PhD, if you've recently graduated, then we'd love to hear from you. Um, we're looking for articles typically of around 2,000, maybe up to 3,000 words. We encourage you to send in, well, basically work in progress is absolutely fine, but it's material that's aimed at a popular audience. So, um, avoid yeah avoiding academic jargon wherever possible it's it's just a great place to communicate your ideas and develop your ideas i think and maybe get a bit of a bit or a few skills in communicating with a with a broader audience and we've been on a bit of a hiatus for most of the first part of this year for fairly understandable reasons um, as, as the world quietly burnt down. But you know, we, we're, we're well and truly back on our feet. There's been a couple of articles out in the last month or so. And yes, the games column should be back up and running, hopefully very shortly. So I think that's it. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Rob, for this conversation. That was all very interesting. And I hope to hear from 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 your, your projects next, from Business Developments. No, thank, thank you, thank you both very much for having me. Um, it's been it's been an absolute pleasure, and I hope you have a great night. <laughs>